hello lovelies, in this video we are going to be looking at your AQA Combined Science Foundation Bulgy Paper 2 for 2022 exams. In this video and in the accompanying workbook what I've done is I've taken everything and moved it all around to match the advanced information. So all of the major focuses of the exam are going to be at the beginning then we're going to look at the required practicals and then we're going to look at the stuff that is not listed. So the bits that will probably come up as like one or two mark questions, it does not include anything that the exam board has told us is not going to be on the exam. You and me guys, we're going to get through this together. Here we have the male and female um, endocrine system. The pituitary gland is in the brain. Thyroid is in the neck. The adrenal glands are in the kidneys. Pancreas is hiding behind the stomach. Ovaries are kind of like hip level. And testes hang below the penis. The testes produce testosterone, which has the effect of um, growing muscles, making the balls and penis drop and grow larger, um, increasing the rate of hair growth. Oestrogen is produced in the ovaries, that is responsible for the maturation of eggs and the menstrual cycle. The pancreas produces insulin, which is important for regulating blood glucose levels. The adrenal glands produce adrenaline, which is important for our fight or flight response. The thyroid produces thyroxine, which is important in regulating our metabolism. The pituitary gland is very busy. Among other things, it produces follicle-stimulating hormone, FSH, and luteinizing hormone, LH. There are two different types of diabetes, type 1 and type 2. In type 1 diabetes, the pancreas doesn't work properly, so it doesn't produce the right amount of insulin. In type 2 diabetes, cells start to become insensitive to insulin. Symptoms for both are going to be a loss of weight, um, an increased need to wee, being very thirsty, blurry vision, fatigue, so being very sleepy and hunger. Treatment for type 1 diabetes is going to involve insulin injections. Type 2 diabetes, it's going to be controlling diet, exercise. Gene is a stretch of DNA that codes for a characteristic. Genome is all the genes in a body, or all of the genes that you have. A gamete is going to be a sex cell, so in um, humans, that is a sperm or the egg. Chromosome is bundled up. DNA. Alleles are different versions of genes. Dominant means you only need one gene to express a characteristic. Recessive means you need two identical recessive genes to express a characteristic. Homozygous means your genes are the same. Heterozygous means your genes are different. Genotype is what genes you have. And phenotype is a collection of characteristics that you have. We can work out the chances of a disease or a phenotype being passed on by doing a genetic cross. These are one of the things that I think should be laid out very formally and very properly. So mother's genotype big R, little r, mother's phenotype is a carrier, father's phenotype, big R, little r, father's phenotype, a carrier, mother's gametes, R, 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 R. Now we can move the mother's gametes over here, R, R, and the father's down here, R, R, and then fill in these ones down and these ones across. So the mother, R, R, then this one down, R, R, the father, this one across, R, R, and then for the father, this one across, R, R. Then the offspring are going to have dominant, dominant, so they're going to be homozygous and a non-sufferer. Two of the potential offspring, or half the potential offspring, are going to be heterozygous and a carrier. And then out of the offspring, one in four of them has a chance of being double, homozygous, recessive, and being a sufferer. Polydactyly is a condition where the people get one, two, three, four, five, six little adorable baby fingers, and it is dominant. So here we have a mother who has two homozygous recessive and five fingers, and a father who has a dominant and a recessive and has six fingers. We can feel in the genetic cross, mother, mother, 
mother, father, 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 father. And we can see somebody who has this dominant disease, if they have um, one gene, they will pass it on and 50, or that offspring has a 50% chance of also having polydactyly. Cystic fibrosis is a recessive disease. So as we saw in the first example, if we have two parents that are carriers, there is a one in four chance of an offspring having the disease. If um, only one parent is a carrier, then the chance of the baby having um, a cystic fibrosis are virtually nothing apart from brand new mutation and chance of them being a carrier are 50%. If your family has a known genetic disease or if you have a child that had a genetic disease, you could opt to have IVF and before your embryo was implanted back into you, you could have it screened, so embryo screening or pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. The advantages to this are that you can test the embryo so it only put back healthy embryos so that chances are the baby be born is going to be healthy and is going to survive or you can um, have an embryo implanted which could help be a match a genetic match for a sibling already born the disadvantages of this is that embryos are going to be created and destroyed and some people have religious objections to this an ecosystem are the animals plants everything living within a certain area the community are the plants the animals that live there and they're all dependent upon one another another they cannot survive without each other for example the animals eat the plants they can't survive without doing that and the plants rely on the animals to distribute their seeds to survive and reproduce a species needs food water air and sometimes but not always a mate Abiotic and biotic factors are things that are going to affect any organism. Abiotic are non-living factors such as light intensity, temperature, water levels, pH, iron levels, wind, carbon dioxide levels and oxygen levels. Biotic factors are going to be living factors such as food, predators and pathogens. An increase or reduction or removal or introduction of any of these factors can have a dramatic impact on a community. For example, the introduction of a new predator or a new pathogen could wipe out a community. An increase or a decrease in the temperature could mean that the, an organism's food source is gone or an organism can't survive in that environment. And plants and animals aren't going to be able to survive without sufficient levels of carbon dioxide and oxygen. All the food chains start in the same place with the sun providing energy. And then from this energy things are going to grow, mainly plants, and they get eaten by other things. Whether it's um, grass being eaten by cows and then going on to be eaten by us or whether we eat the plants directly or whether the plants hear the corn is being turned into corn syrup which is used in ketchup. Whether we eat them directly or process them, we are a top consumer. Whereas other things like cows are going to be herbivores because they just eat plants. So the direction of the arrow is really important in food chains. The direction of the arrow means eaten by so for the carbon cycle, I'm referring a lot to organic compounds. And if you haven't heard this phrase before, it can be a bit confusing. Organic compounds are just any compound that has carbon in it. And just to remind you, a compound is two or more elements that are chemically bonded together. So here are all the different locations that carbon can be. It can be carbon dioxide in the air or carbon dioxide can be dissolved in oceans. It can be as organic compounds in plants or in animals. These organic compounds can also be present in the dead plants and animals and they are in fossil fuels. Now you need to know the various different ways that they change um, um, from all these different locations and what the processes are called. So let's start with fossil fuels. When we have fossil fuels, we can burn them so that the carbon in them goes into the air. And the fancy name for this is combustion. When the carbon dioxide is in the air, it can be taken up by plants. And this is a process of photosynthesis. And the opposite can occur as well because plants will also undergo respiration. Plants get eaten by animals, and then plants and animals both die. From the um, organic compounds that are in the dead um, plants and animals, they can turn into fossil fuels by either, either being buried or being sedimented, or they can just go straight back up into the air 
affected by the process of decay. And then lastly, our animals are also undergoing respiration. So carbon isn't a static thing. It is constantly moving around from carbon dioxide in the air to carbon compounds that are in animals, plants, in dead animals, and then being inserted into fossil fuels, which can then be burnt and put the carbon dioxide back in the air. This is a very, very complicated, involved process that happens over millions of years, and you need to know all of these steps. The water cycle is much more complicated than you think it is going to be. Heat energy from the sun comes down, warms the surface of the water on the earth, and this is going to cause the water to evaporate. As the water evaporates, it's going to become less dense, it's going to rise up, and then it's going to condense when it starts to cool down. This is when we're going to get clouds formed. When the clouds are heavy, when the water has accumulated so much, it is going to start to rain, and the fancy word for rain is precipitation. After it's rained, the water is going to do a number of things. It can go into the mountains where it will sink in or percolate deep into the mountains where it's then going to pick up stuff like irons, salts, and um, which is going to affect the, the taste and the chemistry of the water. This will then come out somewhere as a little stream and go into the river. Some of it's going to go into the soil, moving slowly back towards um, a river or a lake as through flow. Some of the water will go straight onto the ground. If the rock or the mud is already saturated, if it is full of water or the rock is impermeable, then that will just run off into the nearest river or stream or lake or reservoir. All of it ending up at some point in a large collection of water, whether that is in the sea again, or whether that's in a reservoir, or whether that's in a lake. Some of that water will get taken up by plants and used in photosynthesis. It will also come out of plants in a process of transpiration, and then go up into make clouds, and then the cycle can start all over again. Microorganisms are part of the system of biotics and abiotic factors that help break down old things, for example, old food, so that the components can be recycled back through the system. If you want to investigate what grows in a field, you can use a quadrat, which is going to be, um, say, a metre square. You throw that on the ground and count what is in there. Randomly moving it around the field so that you get a wide coverage. You're going to need to estimate the size of the field so that you can work out how much um, area there is. Work out your plant population per area that you've measured and then multiply that up to cover the entire field. A transect is a bit more ordered. You start at a point, take a line and then take measurements at every single point along that line. Um, this could be, say, from a hedge moving away so that you are varying things like light intensity or distance from water. Homeostasis is the maintenance of a constant internal environment. And to keep your body functioning properly, we need to control our blood glucose levels, our water levels, and our temperature. The brain is the control centre, and that's going to be sending signals um, to various parts of the body. For example, to the pancreas, which is responsible for producing insulin. Um, effectors muscles um, are going to do things like moving, for example, shivering. And then glands are going to be responsible for the production of other hormones. We can genetically modify plant DNA, so we can take our DNA with our required characteristic. Whether that is a drought resistance gene, so that countries that don't get much rain and very, very susceptible to drought can survive that better, so that our crops are going to grow better, whether that's um, a gene which um, produces a vitamin, so that countries that um, don't have a good food security, where food is shortage, where people are dying because they're not getting the right amount of vitamins, we can engineer the food, the rice that they're growing so that it produces more vitamins, so it's healthier, so that less people are going to die. 
or whether it's just pesticide resistance or the ability to resist being eaten by um, pests, being eaten by bugs so that yields are higher. We can take that gene and put it into our original plant DNA producing a genetically modified plant. We can add in the new gene to the plant DNA, we can produce seeds and then the farmers can grow those seeds and the plants will have this new desired characteristic. Some people don't like genetically modified um, plants because they think it's interfering with nature. Evidence for evolution comes from fossils. Um, not everything leaves fossils because fossils come from the hard parts, the bones, the soft bits are just going to decay away so won't leave fossils. And we can see um, evolution happening with bacteria because they multiply very quickly, 20 minutes in some circumstances. So we can see changes, um, adaptations for natural selection being passed on and happening very, very quickly. Fossils can show us changes that have happened and how different animals are related. From these, we can use or draw an evolutionary tree, showing us how closely things are related to things on one branch are going to be very closely related, and the point where they branch off, that's where they became genetically distinct. Carl Linnaeus developed taxonomy, which is the study of grouping living things together. We can see on our evolution evolutionary tree here that some things are very closely grouped together and to get to other things you actually have to go quite a long distance. He develops a naming system where we have each um, organism has a two-part Latin name and this will tell us how closely related they are. It's a bit like them having a first name and a second name, a genus and then a species. The genus will be the wide overarching type of thing and then the species will be exactly what thing it is. With each new development in biology, with each new development in genetics, we understand more and more about classifications. So our taxonomy and our evolutionary tree is evolving all the time. The three domain system divides everything in life into three groups, eukaryotes, bacteria and archaea. Eukaryotes are things that have nuclei. There are a wide range of different types of pollution, whether it's air pollution from smog, water pollution where oil or rubbish is getting into the water, um, or plastic pollution where we're just leaving rubbish all over the place. And this could have a dramatic impact on the plants and animals that live there. If we're changing the chemistry of the water that they're living in, if we're pumping in nitrates or fertilizer, or if we're pumping in too much oil, the fish and the plants are going to struggle to survive. With plastic, these are being eaten by animals and the chemicals in there are moving up the food chain. And air pollution is having a massive effect on the animals, not just uh, the breathing, but whether they can, their ability to camouflage. Ouch! This is why in some videos I have unexplained scratches.